the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people are evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spend a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family member was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. It was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming, thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dan DuPont of HawaiiTracker.com, bringing you guys another Hawaiian Volcano Tracker update. Today is Thursday, May 30th, 2023. How are you doing today, Dane? Yeah, doing pretty good. How are you doing? Doing all right. It's been pretty quiet on Kilauea. We've been catching up on some of our other obligations here, but we're back with everyone to share the little details of the nuances of, of nothing happening, really, when it comes down to it. Yeah, I mean, everybody's kind of anticipating something, you know, eventually happening. So every decent sized earthquake, everybody checks up like, oh, is this it? Are we going into something? Right. Is this a, is this an earthquake uh, swarm? So, yeah, talk about a little bit of that today. Yeah, there have been a couple of earthquakes. We can kind of follow up on the one last week that we that we covered live uh, on Mauna Loa's uh, southeast flank. There is one that was on Kamaehua Kanaloa, formerly known as Loihi, um, over the weekend couple of little you know nothing super significant there but we can talk about those as well and i thought we'd also just do a quick look back at the last five years of changes on kilauea summit spend a little time on that just to catch our breath while we have you know while we have a, t a chance to reflect here and, and just do that a little bit before we come up on our 2018 eruption which is happening in about a month or so yeah i can't believe it's already snicking up on us that quick yeah so yeah um yeah uh, we'll be Covering a regular basis, uh, Dana will be leading discussion on the chat, collecting questions as usual, and tossing some in here for us to discuss as as appropriate. And anything else, Dana, before we get into it? No, I think that's it. Um, we'll be you know active in the chat and 
uh, try and get everybody's questions in later. Um, other than that, we'll go through it. And get All right. It. Yeah, it's just just to sh- uh, say what we got sharing on the screen with you guys. This is a live looking at Kilauea here. This is the live cam, and it's a no surface activity. It's just a lot of steam and fume there. But um, let's blow it up here and let's uh, get into our summary for the week. So just a second here. Let me make sure everything's going well here. All right. So this week's Hawaiian Volcano Summary. You guys are looking at the last week of surface images from the KW camera from the USGS HVO on Kilauea. And what you're seeing is quite a lot of fume and steam, but no surface lava still. It's been a full three weeks now since we've seen lava on the surface on Kilauea. And changes are still occurring underground, very similar to last week. Uh, the long and short of it is that earthquake rates are still moderately elevated above what they were last month. So here we see the tail end of, of the average level, the background last month, which the first week of the of this, this graph is showing that. Over the last three weeks here, it's been slightly elevated at this slightly higher level. And it's not been at alarming levels that we associate with uh, pre-eruption sequences um, or the intrusions. We did have that one small intrusion that was this day right here. But otherwise, it's been fairly steady and stable as magma is essentially recharging underground within Kilauea Summit. Um, I thought I would just summarize this by showing you guys this map of earthquakes for the last month on Kilauea. And I'll blow it up here in the Kilauea Summit. And this gives you an idea of of where the earthquakes are happening. Right? So it's happening quite a bit uh, along this inner caldera area, but also tailing off to the south a little bit here in this Kauai area, upper southwest rift connector that we saw an intrusion in back in August 2021. So all of this is considered that greater summit area, part of that summit magma reservoir storage zone. And what we're not seeing is much else on a rift zone elsewhere, right? We do see here some south flank. The south flank is still adjusting. So the volcano is still adjusting um, and refilling mostly at the summit there. So that's the long and short of Kilauea. We still await the next development. Um, given the conditions, it's possible that the eruption could resume at any point. Uh, or we could have a new eruption, um, not through the same conduit. And that could ramp up fairly quickly if it's going to be a small localized thing. So still restrained to the summit, no threat uh, to the rift zones at this point in time, nothing uh, further to worry about that's changed. And that's the summary of Kilauea. And just for comparison, here is the last month of earthquakes on Mauna Loa. And while Mauna Loa is also inflating as evidenced by its toe, really this is the big difference in the volcanoes. Mauna Loa is not showing any pressure at the summit really, no, none of the earthquakes that we saw preceding the 2022 eruption. So all is still quiet, and we'll wait to see what happens next. And that's the Hawaiian Volcano Summary for the week. So to get into a little more detail here on Kilauea, let me... Put, we'll go straight into monitoring on Kilauea today. So let's put that up here and start off with some of our graphs. And actually, I'll just keep going on the earthquakes a little bit longer. So this is the last week of earthquakes, so it's not quite so crowded, not so many... Uh, circles drawn on here. And so more recently, you see that there's still been activity at the summit. It's really not at that huge uh, cloud level of concern. That's really the whole month integrated. So on a week-to-week basis, this is about how many we're getting. You see there is that in- inner caldera cloud, and then here is that area that's south of the caldera and that greater summit area still, right? This whole area adjusts. This, this little triangle adjusts. We have a southwest rift connector here and a Southeast Rift connector here, and there's this little triangle right in here that kind of adjusts to all that movement from the summit and allows th- things to accommodate. So that's the uh, last week, and we still have south flank earthquakes. You see, there's a a few more than we sometimes see here in this middle middle south flank zone right in there, including a larger. So I believe this was a 3.0 that we saw here within the last week. So there's certainly adjustments happening in the south flank area because the summit, as it's swelling and filling underground, does want to exert a force in that direction. Right? So you can have these adjustments of all these separate blocks in the south flank. And these have been still recovering post-2018 collapse. 
So some of them are wiggling a little funny or doing some interesting little rotations. So it's still it's still doing that. It's still adjusting and propagating that that outwards here. Looking just over here to the Pahala zone, all the blue earthquakes are that deep Pahala feeder source from the hot spot up into the roots of the volcanoes. Um, these are colored by depth. So when you see there's actually some red ones up here that are disconnected. So this is on the surface uh, within Kilauea actually. So you can see that the southwest flank of Kilauea is also seem to be doing a little bit of adjustment locally there as well. Nothing major to worry about there, but just noting these adjustments happening. So back to our one, one month earthquakes, you can see there's that full picture there. Um, beyond this inner cloud that we have of these orange and yellow and red dots of the summit reservoir zone, we do have this, this uh, smattering of blue and green, which are these deeper earthquakes kind of around Kilauea's root itself. And so you see the blue earthquakes, not just down here in Pahala, but also around Kilauea here. So interesting to see how those have been active over the last month. So all that would suggest that the supply to the, to the volcano is still uh, pretty healthy. And so here's a cross section of that, looking at depth and then longitude here. So there is those deep Pahala earthquakes. Note there's a big gap right here between that deep zone and the surface activity. And so these are, this is an independent process with the magma injecting into that uh, magmatic web down beneath Pahala there. And here above we have that adjustment of the surface zone more, more likely to Mauna Loa and Kilauea's surface movement there. So that's how it looks. But here to the side, here's the other blue earthquakes that are surrounding Kilauea. So you can imagine that this area in the middle that has no earthquakes is more or less the pathway up right there. Where a lot of times uh, when you have the, the well-established conduit and you have liquid moving through it, you're not going to get any big earthquakes. It's just going to flow through more passively. It's more when it's pressurizing or trying to push us away to somewhere new, you're going to get the earthquakes. And there's been speculation in the past that this all connects going this way from here to here and then this feeding upwards. So all it means is it seems like magma is still coming to the volcano, fairly healthy rate, and that is reflected by the signals we see near the surface, both in GPS and a tilt, which we'll get to here shortly. But just look at it one, one further way. Now we're looking at depth and time here for the last month. And you can see that there are some variations in this deeper blue zone right in here, the Pahala earthquakes, but it's more or less steady, steady on average. More noticeable is this upper orange and yellow cloud, which seems like if it were, draw, were to draw a dividing line, I'd put it right in there, where it seems much more intense over here to the right than it was to the left uh, prior to that. So that corresponds to the, to the beginning of the pause on Kilauea right in there. So once magma stopped reaching the surface and erupting as lava, uh, it starts building more pressure in the ground, refilling, recharging, and quaking its boundaries there, which is evident by the just sheer number of earthquakes here. Um, to kind of put this in a form that we more often look at, here is our bar graph of earthquakes per day and the same month time. And before I scroll all the way up, you see that this jump occurs right here at that same point in time that you see this, this pattern change. So that's all tied together. And as I just stated in our summary, the earthquake rates are still elevated uh, above that previous level. And so it's hard to tell now. I think I was, I was calling it around 20 earthquakes per day on average. I mean, it looks more like 30 here for that first week of the month. And maybe we're up around 50 or, or so for the last three weeks. And that might seem like a lot. That's like doubling. You might think more or less of the earthquakes. But just to remind you, when we've seen other intrusions in the past, we've seen the earthquakes climb not just double the rate, but like five or six or ten times as many earthquakes. So twice as many is a moderate increase uh, only. And so we're still, still in that phase now. And if it were to escalate to larger numbers of earthquake counts, then you might imagine that's building and getting ready to burst at some point in time. So we're not there yet. There's no indication of that happening yet. It could come on pretty quickly, but we have no indication of it happening soon. Looking at that same time frame for the tilt, here is that summit tilt, and you can see right in there is that same uh, timestamp, and that's when we had a change in the tilt. We're looking at kind of this baseline here. Maybe I draw on the bottom right there. That's when it started coming up and increasing. And maybe it's it's steadied out a little bit here. It's hard to tell exactly what's going on there. Um, we have the, the now typical background deflation inflation events superimposed and all that. So it's hard to pick out everything, right? And um, 
overall, it's looking fairly steady, but still increasing, if anything, here on a tilt. So switching to the one year time frame now, looking at earthquakes per week against the last year. This gives us a little better context because we have here um, the, the, the period of time from when we had to pause back in December of 2022 that uh, accompanied Mauna Loa's eruption. And then earthquakes building up to the, the beginning of January 2023 eruption. That's this cluster right in here. So you can see we're up at five, 600 earthquakes per week at that point in time. Now we're down at three to 400. So we're not really at that same level of elevated activity. But compared to what we had during that, that, that period of eruption from January to early March in here, it is, it is slightly elevated a bit. And on that same time scale of one year, here is a cement GPS measuring distance north or south, south across the caldera of Kilauea. And you can see those similar patterns matching here as well. There is that growing extension, the sides getting further and further apart, leading up to that eruption that occurs here, and then it basically relieves the pressure and it sags back in. And you can see that, that sometime in late February, early March, it starts picking back up again and starts extending again as well. And so not as much getting out of the volcano at the top, but still coming in below to cause it to bulge and spread as evident by, by the GPS here. So all that is similar to the last couple of weeks really, but just to recap it all, and here is Pu'o'o, the distance north and south across that upper Middle East rift zone. And for the last year as well, steadily contracting all the way down. We zoom way, way, way in here at the very end. It looks, looks like it might, might be doing a little bit of a wiggle. I went and looked at the individual components, and it doesn't seem like anything alarming is happening there. It's probably just a small adjustment to that south flank movement, more than likely. But we'll really have to come back to this in another week or two to, to have this data be cleaned up and filtered and sorted, and we'll have a better view of what, what this actually is, is showing. Um, however, there is no uplift anywhere in that rift zone, which would be something to expect if that was actually caused by magma. So that's not, not the case, um, but still adjusting there on a south flank as well, and in a very minor way as well. So that is the monitoring here for Kilauea this week. Um, it's worth, as usual, showing our source, which is a USGS Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Um, this is their daily update from today. Thursday, March 30th, 50 a.m. We're still at alert level advisory, color code yellow, um, getting daily updates. But the volcano is not erupting, and lava has not uh, been at the surface since March 9th, I believe, was the last time I saw that resurfacing event. But March 7th is the official date of the pause, as declared by the USGS. So they still note, resumption of activity may recur in the near future with little to no warning. No significant changes have been observed along either of the volcano's rift zones. Low rate of deformation and modest rates of seismicity continue across the volcano. The only other thing that I was wanted to point out here is they did on Tuesday update and correct their SO2 emission rate. It's actually reported now as 155 tons per day on March 21st. So same date being reported, but different value. Right, This was at 321 before. Although we saw that the VOG mapping project had that 155. Therefore, we suspected that was the, the true number there. So um, yeah, as well as the plot too, too that we saw the SO2 plot. So that's really the, the information from the SGS that's worth highlighting. Um, otherwise, they are the source for all the webcams and all the other data we're showing you guys here today. So we'll switch to the visuals. What is actually happening visually in a volcano? Even with no lava on the surface, there is other stuff going on. So here I'll show you guys. This is the KW camera. For the last week, night and day, so you can see the darkness of night and that steaming, fuming crater floor during the day. You can see it's the same spots that seem to be doing the fuming, this, those spots that were the vents of lava out from, from beneath that crater floor into that western lake here in the foreground and on the east side of that central island over here, more towards the top of the image, but still right there in the middle. Not only that, you see quite a lot of fume coming up from the edges of the crater around this perimeter. I'd imagine that as it's been fairly rainy here the last you know, last week, that, that water and even over the last month and a half or so, all that groundwater starts trying to flow back towards this this uh, area. And before it can get, reach the lava and do anything funky, it just basically vaporizes and gets entrained up, comes up with steam here. So that's the KW camera for the last week. 
here is a recent image from the F1 camera, the thermal camera. And to outline it, this is that western basin that had the lava lake previously. There's a central island and an old lava lake from, not old, but the more recent eastern, eastern lava lake from January to March was over here. So all we see glowing is this west vent pond area um, that seems to be still fairly hot and conducting that heat upwards from beneath that crust of all that lava that's gathered below there. No road change, I won't show any animation of this, it's just uh, just what you see what you get there. It's pretty much the same the whole time. So just to, to put in a little variety, here's our S1 camera for the last week and I've once again just made it, made it daytime views. Just to get a different view of the, of the remains of that eastern lava lake basin right in here in the foreground. There it is right in there. But also to point out this bank that's on this east side of the crater, it seems to be putting up quite a bit of fume as well. So I'll play this again and let it loop a little bit. Um, and as we anticipate lava coming back to the surface at some point in time, we know it's building underground. Where will it crack and come up to the surface? Who really knows? But we can take a look at these different views from time to time and familiarize ourselves in case this view happens to change dramatically at some point here. So there's an S1 camera and just showing the fuming zone here on that eastern side. Okay, so as you can see, uh, the viewing is not lava viewing anymore, although you're calling it lava viewing report. Really what you're seeing is eruption site now. Um, so there was no lava to see. However, the sites were still pretty awesome, I think. Um, I came to Hawaii many times early on without seeing lava and just saw the fuming, steaming crater and other aspects that were similar to that. Um, but just be aware of that. If you're coming for, for volcanic viewing, it's now a daytime activity. What you really can see is best in the daytime to see the fume and the steam and nothing to really see at night because there's no glow or lava that's shining through the darkness there. So we'll keep it brief with that today in our lava viewing report. But just to keep it in there for completeness, we'll turn now to our hazards. And even though the volcano is not putting out lava, it is still putting out gas. Not a whole lot. 150 tons per day is not a whole lot for this volcano. However, it it's, would exceed the EPA uh, uh, guidelines for industrial operations in the country, so it's still, it's still significant and can still put out VOG. Um, we haven't had a whole lot with those low, low values, that really helps. But you do see a pop-up a little bit in the volcano area and coming up um, Kalmana in, into the saddle towards Mauna Loa summit a little bit there. Maybe towards the weather observatory area in there. So not a whole lot, but there is a bit here showing up as you can see from the bog mapping project forecast from University of Hawaii. Likewise, purple air, citizen science sensors showing green most of the places at present here. But as usual, we like to go back and look at some of these um, historical data. So for the last couple of days here from the National Park, you can see that there was a spike of particulate matter at the Volcano Arts Center today. Um, looks like that was at 5 a.m. It was at moderate levels. And if I scroll down here, everything is green, green, green. So for the most part, it's fine everywhere. And you know, once in the great wild, as it changed a little bit, here you see at the steam vents, there was an, an orange at 12.45 a.m. on the 30th SO2 spike, but then back to normal. And if I go all the way down here to, where was it? Oh, my, maybe it's scrolled off my map here, but I think there was somewhere else near the visitor center. It was also occasionally showing a spike of that higher, higher alert levels too. So follow park guidance if you're going in the park, and otherwise it's low levels but can still be a nuisance for those who live nearby and are sensitive especially. So that's the hazard summary here today. So before we move on from Kilauea, I thought this would be the time to take a look back at the last five years at the summit. And so I thought we would just real quick show you guys a few videos of that. And I thought I'd start off with just this image that was from March 19th, 2018. This is before that 2018 eruption when lava had to come up quite a bit. It was starting to overflow from Hale Ma'u's Overlook Crater, which is this one right in here. But at that point in time, March 19th was actually the, the anniversary of the opening of that Overlook Crater. Uh, through an explosion March 19th, 2008, right? So that's the 10-year prequel to the five-year summary here, where the volcano had come up 
um, to establish this new lava lake within Halimount Mountain Crater. And from there, I'll play you guys a few of these videos. So here's a video from April 4th, 2018, shot from the Overlook. And there's lava spattering and bursting within the lava lake down below. It, it would later come up and overflow that whole pit um, within a few weeks of this video being taken. But you can see that there, that was the activity that was kind of typical for this previous um, 10 years and more so towards the end when it was up near the surface, more visible. So when you're into the future there, now 8th of April 2019, and this is uh, an overflight of the crater. After the 2018 collapse, we'll focus on that. Oh, kill that helicopter sound. Sorry, guys. Uh, we'll focus on the actual 2018 eruption uh, in the future here, but this is just a summit post eruption collapse view showing you that full scale of the pit where anything had filled it in. Uh, just steam and a bunch of rubble there at the bottom. All the blocks of collapse are still visible in this, in this uh, footage. And pretty striking the scale of it uh, when you could see all of it now. And you know, one thing that I've noticed putting this together is we've really buried all that inner detail, right? And it, it makes it seem like the collapse was not as big right, right now just because we can't see that, the depth of it anymore. We can see the breadth of it still, and we can't quite see the depth of it anymore. And this video is a good reminder of both the depth and the breadth of that collapse in 2018. All the way up in here, this is the remaining untouched crater floor is up in here. So all the way to here was all the collapse zone of the three months of summer in 2018. All right, now March 2020. This is when uh, this time-lapse video of water infilling that collapse pit was released. So this is November through March of 2020, November 2019 to March 2020, showing that after that collapse, had cooled a bit, water was able to percolate in from the sides. Um, that was that about one year era of water at the summit of Kilauea there. And so interesting how every year here we're seeing something different. One year into the, into the future again, puts us at April 2021, 16 April, here's an overflight. And by that point in time, that innermost pit and innermost blocks have been covered. We can still see this yellow bank of sulfur along this north wall especially. And it's something we can't see at all today. We can still see quite a bit of distance between this block down to that lava lake surface in there. And the lava lake focused primarily here on this western side from the western vent. With that central island already prominently in place there in the center. A little closer view, there's that, that western downdrop block. And looking more closely at that west vent area in the lava lake that was kind of just nested between the west vent and the central island here. Note the fume coming up from the wall still, right? So when we see the edge of the, the crater steaming nowadays, you can see that it's been steaming in those areas for quite a while. And that was a spot that had all this, this uh, sulfur deposits um, as that gas evaporated from there as well. So a couple more here. Coming up to the last year, 2nd of March 2022, we're flight of the summit. So by that point in time, you can see that whole inner pit is all the way buried. It's hard to see some of the edges here, but we're actually getting pretty close to that western downdrop block right in there. Don't see as much. It's a little bit of the wrong angle, but I think it'll come around here. Um, don't see as much of that coloration, the yellow stain on the wall from the sulfur deposits, because lava has come up and buried much of that. It's quite a bit broader side to side. Um, that central island is actually more or less the same size as it was before, so it really gives you an idea of how much broader the infilling has been. Right? You still see a little bit of that sulfur here on the sides, and you can see the distance to that western ledge right over there. And we still haven't covered much of this northern ramp in here, and that's something that has happened in that year since. But still at that point in time, West Vent was the active one, putting in a lava lake west of that central island. Not as big, different shape as it was previously, um, but 
there it is. That was one year ago. And I'll just replay this one that we that we showed um, a couple weeks ago. This is March 10th, 2023, this year. Another overflight. And now you see the current state. The lava had started to, to wane by this point in time, so not a whole lot of surface activity here. But you can see all the fume. You can see the fume coming from the sides and a greater extent out here in this northern ramp as well. As the image comes around, you can see some more of that detail too. So, all right. A little closer view here and showing that last western basin view when the lava had mostly stopped overturning within it. So that's just one one uh, snippet from each of the last five years. And I thought I'd maybe pull it all together for you guys by just showing you this little clip. This is now since uh, 2019 all the way to today. And the whole history of infilling of Kilauea Summit. In just a couple of seconds here, you really see that at the beginning of the loop there, the water coming at the bottom, replaced by that burst of lava. It takes a little pause between that first eruption, between 2020 and 2021, um, and in 2021, pausing between May and uh, September, and then resuming all the way up to, to today. Really, the last uh, two months of eruption here at the summit doesn't really show very much because it's just a small little blip compared to the overall uh, multi-year process here. But some really cool things you can see, right? And especially at the end, you notice how this northern ramp here is getting all the way flooded out by that recent activity. Maybe I'll zoom in on that. You can really see that more recent change here within the last year. That's the last thing to have filled in. And we still have been for a while trying to estimate when lava might actually come onto this next down drop block, this lowest one, which is right over here. That's about the lowest point in there. You see a lot of it coming up. Of course, these changes in eruption rates have prevented that from actually happening this far. But if lava does break out within this pit again or nearby, we are familiar now that the first opening stage of each of these eruptions puts out a whole bunch of lava, and it could well flood it to that point very quickly if that were, were to happen. And once, once it's recharged enough to erupt again. So that's a little summary of the last five years in Kilauea Summit. It's really um, been really extraordinary to see such dramatic change year to year and to witness this we're really lucky to catch all this to have all these cameras from usgs pointing here as well and yeah it's just a moment of quiet it's a good time to reflect on how much we've really seen as we've been bringing you guys updates for the last five years here so that's the um last five years on kilauea here and with that we'll transition to earthquakes not just on Kilauea, we talked about those already, but all the ones elsewhere as well. So here's our recent earthquakes. Uh, you see that there is our cluster from last week on Mauna Loa, and it was confirmed um, by Ken Han. We had an audience member ask uh, during our uh, Big Island Press Club event that took place last weekend, which if you haven't checked out, you can go check that out. We're um, reflecting on the... Uh, press coverage and information distribution during a 2022 Mauna Loa eruption. Um, but yeah, he was asked about this earthquake, and it's basically just a, a, a tectonic earthquake, an adjustment of the south flank, southeast flank of Mauna Loa here. So pretty near the eruption site, but you can see it's, it's off to the side. There's really nothing happening at the summit, so it's really, really an adjustment happening on the volcano there. We've talked about the Kilauea ones over here, right? the south flank ones as well. We've talked about Pahala as well, so maybe what I can do here is... Um, come up to, let's see, yeah, zoom it out a bit here, so you can see the, the earthquakes that are happening offshore here to the south. So this right here was at 4.1 that occurred on Kamehua Kanaloa, otherwise known as Loihi. This was down at 8 kilometers depth, about 5 miles or so. So within that volcanic uh, edifice, a uh, structure near the surface, um, put on the the bathymetry here, so you can see a little bit of this shape of Loihi. Loihi was the long, long mountain there, right? But it's important to note that without any seismometers offshore here, that there's a little bit of error in the exact position. So it could well be that these are well on the actual 
volcano. We just can't quite have that correction without the better data there. It's always a challenge to, to project outwards where you can't have a event in between your instruments, but kind of off to the side. And so it can, can lead to a little bit of distortion there. So there it is. Uh, there was a, a 3.2. That's a 3.0 and a 3.2 that preceded it. And the USGS put out an information statement as they do with all earthquakes greater than magnitude 4. So they note that 6.39 p.m. Hawaiian time on Sunday, March 26th, the 4.1 occurred on Kamaehua Kanaloa, Lihi Volcano, a depth of around 5 miles, 8 kilometers, with no impact on either Mauna Loa or Kilauea volcanoes. Here's the interesting part. It is unknown whether these events were caused by any volcanic or intrusive activity on Kamaehua Kanaloa, but no earthquakes and other, but no effect on the other volcanoes. So, could well be. Uh, we haven't really seen any evidence anywhere near the surface. You might not see that at all. We have seen swarms on Lo on Loihi Kamaehua Kanaloa recently before, and so just these few one-offs seem like more like flank adjustments to me. Uh, personally, because we've seen many, many more numerous uh, earthquake flurries, swarms, or what have you out in that area, which th were not associated with this. However, since we can't see, there is always that kind of question mark, and really it comes down to someone in a submarine taking a look every so often to see if anything's changed on the surface of the volcano there. In any case, uh, no big deal down there. There's, you know, um, depending how you define this intrusive activity, right? Like you, you could consider every, all those earthquakes in Pahala could fall under the same category. Right? They could all be intrusive activity. We deep, deep, deep down, far away from people, not really near the surface, but technically speaking, still intrusive. So it's all just part of the buildup of the volcano within that crystal structure. And really, unless it's making a big fuss at the surface, it's, it's uh, part of normal background for us here. So that is the Earthquake update there. Let's zoom it back out. And touch on Mount Loa and the offshore ones here. So now we'll turn to Mount Loa, which will be pretty quick as well. So here is the last month of summit tilt on Mount Loa. It is still rising, you can see. The little wiggles are the day and night cycles here. So the overall pattern though is of inflation still at the summit. So it does appear that magma is still recharging within Mauna Loa summit. That's typical post-eruption pattern. The important thing is that we're lacking the earthquakes as I mentioned before. Here is the one month earthquake rates. It's no notable earthquakes per day. The maximum value here is eight, zero to eight. So some days are getting zero, some days are getting seven. Not a lot of earthquakes there. For better context, here's the last year of earthquakes in the summit. This is that buildup in October 2022, November 2022, December, prior to eruption right there. In comparison, we're way the way down here. So not even to the same level as we saw in the whole year ahead of that 2022 eruption. And once again, the map, there is a last month, nothing to be worried about. You do see this, these few dots, few very small dots here, southeast of the summit, that's that typical South flank of Mauna Loa, southeast flank of Mauna Loa, continuing to move as Kilauea moves out of the way and adjusts. Mauna Loa also can do the same there. So interesting how they interconnect, and they're both adjusting at this point in time. And Kilauea recharging the summit. That's the long and short of the volcanoes this week. So a couple of things that we usually go through. We'll go to Volcano Watch next here. Volcano Watch this week. It's not, not quite as related, but relatable to Hawaii, but uh, does have a few applications. However, since we are um, on a faster pace than usual today, and this is kind of a fun thing to talk about, we can come into it a little bit and, and see their experiment using water cannon experiments to improve understanding of blasts. So this is relevant because we're coming up on the anniversary of St. Helens eruption. USGS has got a big uh, PR campaign on that. Uh, we, we don't cover that as much being out here in Hawaii, but uh, as part of trying to understand lateral or um, directed blasts um, from eruptions here, they essentially took these big barrels, filled them with water, took a bottle and filled it with liquid nitrogen, 
dropped it in there. Uh, the temperature difference causes that bottle to kind of kind of rupture, and the whole water erupts out of there. And here's an image of what that might actually look like to have this barrel on a on a back of this uh, trailer that they have propped upwards to make it kind of a lateral blast. And not only that, they had cameras all around. They had these um, uh, acoustic sensors all around as well, trying to determine if what the signals look like, if they're asymmetric and how, how so. And this is working a fine application in Hawaii where you can have fishers moving from one area to another. And maybe if you have an acoustic network that's sensing, you can see, okay, it's got to be moving in this direction based on the asymmetry we see. So that's kind of the nerdy part of it. But uh, you can read, read more on this on hawaiitracker.com if you can go through it all. But I thought I'd just pull out a couple of things from that original article. It did release a few GIFs, and this is the most interesting one here. A short little video clip of that thing actually blasting off. They filled the barrels with a bunch of colored balls, like the kind you see in the kid play zone, right? So all these go flying out when this blast happens, and they're using uh, software to track these blasts there. So that's what that's what you're seeing superimposed there is the, the different paths of those particles, whether it's the actual water or, or the balls as well in there. They set this up like on a uh, looks like a football field. And yeah, pretty interesting. One last thing on that. One reason why I should be wary of trying this at home, perhaps. Let's see if it'll switch it for me. Oh, no, it's getting a little lag on my screen here. Let me. I think we're having a little bit of lag there, Phil. Yeah, lag a little bit. Yeah, I think it was that that gift didn't come up to, come up so well, but I right. it, yeah. So all right, I close the gif, <laughs> and just why you shouldn't try this at home. Here is a image they release as well. Supplemental mental data showing the bottom of this trailer that had that water barrel on it. Barrel is over here. You can see it's a little bit distorted, bent. The bottom is bulged outwards from that, that force of that blast there. But also, you can see that the actual bed that it was on is all the way ruptured right here. And this, this uh, metal support seems to be totally bent as well, right? So fortunately, that decoupled from the axle. Axle looks okay still. Still, um, don't be yeah, trying this at home. Trailer. <laughs> yeah. All I know is so that my dog, if he saw that, he would have loved it. He would have... Uh... Thought he was in heaven. <laughs> They're chasing the hundreds of balls that go flying out. Yeah, and all the water. He would just it would all the water. Amazing, amazing for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the volcano watch this week. Uh, I did want to just mention one last thing here, which is our community point, and this is an update from Kilauea Eruption Recovery in our community corner this week. Um, there are events happening at the park later in April, but uh, none of them within the next week, so we'll, we'll wait to update you guys on that. But there was a March, end of March 2023 update um, from the Kilauea recovery, and the long and short of it is that there's been a delay, uh, and this is because uh, of FEMA. On the FEMA end of things, they are still doing their environmental assessment, their EA, their legal team has completed the review, and they're making final revisions to their EA document. So, thus, over the next six weeks, the county will be working closely with FEMA to finalize the EA, and then once it's completed, it will be released by FEMA, leading to a 30-day comment period, likely occurring in May. During that time, there will be a community meeting to discuss the findings of the EA and allow public comments, and that will be publicized when they get the dates uh, that are nailed down there. So they understand that this causes fr frustration for residents, However, they are still actively working to address the issues and remain committed to completing the project as soon as possible. So this is just part of how the government works, unfortunately. Um, these guys here at the local level are trying as hard as they possibly can, but it takes the entire hierarchy to be in sync here, and sometimes it doesn't work out as optimally as you would hope. So there it is. Here is a, a new timeline. Let's see if I can get this to zoom in a little more, right? So here in the bottom, 
everything's in the FEMA, in the FEMA court right now. Um, Department of Public Works and Water Supply are essentially just waiting for FEMA to finalize their EA base and issue a notice to proceed, which is anticipated to occur in July-ish, at which point they can do finer engineering designs, um, both the water and roads. Then it leads to procurement and then construction in the first quarter of 2024, currently projected in February. Still subject to change, of course. It's still going through that whole pipeline um, of permissions, right? Um, but that is the that current timeline. And I'll scroll it all the way down here, pass all their updates. And just to recap um, what the plan actually is, once they get the construction underway, phase one is Lighthouse Road. Um, that little section from that used to be Four Corners area, um, as well as 137 to Kapoho Beach Road down here right, to restore access to uh, the neighborhood back in here, right? Although it all needs to be um, redeveloped, having a road is, is the first step towards recovering it. So that's phase one. Um, phase two occurring at the same time as phase one is Pohoiki Road here, Upper Lower Pohoiki Road. So they're hoping to work on those from, from both ends at the same time, right in here. And then once this upper part is done, they'll move on to this phase three part, Highway 137 from the Poho Beach Road all the way to Pohuiki Road. And similarly, when they're done with Pohuiki Road, they'll, they'll follow that with the east of Mackenzie phase four, lower 137 completion there. So that's still the plan. You can see they have purple where it's both road and water lines and just red where it's just roads. So that's why it's taking, taking both departments there. And what's uh, what the plan still looks like there. So that's our community corner this week. And I'll pass it over to you, Dane. Yeah, all right. Well, thank everybody for uh, tuning in today. You know, we rely on the viewers to help share the message, get it out there on the algorithm and all that kind of stuff. So the likes, the subscriptions, all that kind of stuff helps. And we appreciate it. You know, hate asking for that stuff, but that's the way it always works on YouTube um, and on Facebook as well. So we are on Facebook. For anybody that's not on there, that's where most of the stuff happens. We end up uh, running the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group, which is a lot more content than we post on the YouTube or the Hawaii Tracker site. and it, if you're not part of that i you know recommend joining that um if you want a more or a bit of what we share about the volcanoes that would be on hawaiitracker.com and that's just the raw bits from me and phil and anybody else that's on the moderation team and yeah we were uh, I was, yeah i was just gonna say yeah uh, it's, it's it's nice to see everyone else posting their pictures of the volcano and their their input right you guys are just hearing us on our channel but what, what's really nice about that facebook group is all the other contributions that come in from other community members too. So just want to plug that a little more and emphasize what you said there, Dane. Right. Yeah. It'll be interesting. The next eruption, um, each one, you know, that happens, it gets a little bit higher up to the, the, into the stadium. So the, the top bleacher seats, the nose bleed seats can, you know, really actually see it now. And it's going to be a pretty crazy view from everywhere when it, when it does go back in the caldera again. And I think that's pretty much certain. Like, it's just going to be a great show as long as, you know, it's been like the last ones, right? Uh, you get a spectacular beginning, fountains and stuff like that, and maybe on the edge of the caldera but or in the caldera. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. once we're, That's kind of what we're all waiting for now is that, you know, that rush back to the summit or back to the, you know, into the park to yeah. see where it's at. The new uh, fisher that should be, you know, whenever it does happen, should be pretty spectacular to see. We've seen it take one month before. We've seen it take four months to do that before, right? So really, it's really anyone's guess at this point how long she'll take. Right. Uh, we did have a couple of donations come through. I want to recognize those. One from uh, Benjamin who, with an A20 suicide. says, uh, beer and pizza money. Appreciate it there. We also had a long-time supporter, Gary Bryan, come through with a $35 super chat. says, appreciate these updates, Phil and Dane. Appreciate the long time support there, Gary. And yes, um, you know, we also do take uh, donations on the whitetracker.com uh, site and appreciate everybody that's donated there. All right. I don't think we have many questions. Um, One more. Thank you. Oh, yeah. We want to thank uh, County of Hawaii for the Bye Bye Grant. 
it's um really something special for the county you know to us for the county to take this uh on up and uh, help fund this type of content and uh, information sharing and educational purposes and all that uh, so we appreciate county why and their support through the bye bye grant program yeah that's really uh, allowed us to really bring you mauna loa 2022 kilauea 2022 um, all the variations kilauea 2023 so far so we yeah, really appreciate it good timing and we hope to continue that work right and it's just such a better business model than you know having to sell out for the clickbait which is basically what everybody that's doing it via, or most people that are doing it via the pro for profit model right that end up having to do just to make it work and we don't want to do that we want to try and give you the more real information without just the unnecessary clickbait just to get the clicks because that's the model for business basically yeah, and really, we're all about disaster response and preparedness, right? And so trust is fundamental to that, and we want to make sure that we're offering information that's real and not just trying to spam you guys with whatever, because that's what we need to keep the keep the thing afloat. So hopefully that came through in Mauna Loa 2022 and our other eruptions, and yeah, I really appreciate that insight there, Dane. Yeah. All right, well... Um... Yeah, we did have a question about Poiki come through about you know, what's its status and its status is we are still waiting on money to be allocated from the state legislature. I heard that uh, there's some maybe potential hiccups in, but it's you know it's a bunch of until the, you know the legislative session ends, you really don't know, and even then you know you're still waiting for the allocation of the money and all that kind of stuff. So it's basically on a wahoo with the decision making and just getting the money to allocate because they still need to actually fund the entire project the state they have to allocate the 40 million dollars and right. the team is going to reimburse 30 mil but they have to come up with the lump sum up front right and is this, that right this is Pohiki beach more. right different from the road we talked about earlier about the actual beach and the, the dredging project okay. just to clarify yeah so yeah if anyone you know if you want to make your voice heard that's who to talk to is the the, the congress in honolulu yeah, that's who's, whose hands it's in right now. Yep. Um, and yeah, other than that, I think we got through an update in under an hour. And I kind of want to clock it there so we at least say we got one. All right. Yeah, I wasn't going to say anything. I don't want to jinx us again. Um, but maybe we got a few minutes shaved here. Right. We're baby steps. We're getting shorter, more concise updates. But, you know. I was going to throw extra stuff in there when there's less going on, too. So that's, what's, that's my I know, point. right? <laughs> no it's good though i mean you know that that the replay of the entire eruption is kind of you know the, we'll post the gif so you can see it without lag and all that kind of stuff and be able to play with it a little bit more um yeah put up next it's, it's just so much change in five years right they think of geologic time elsewhere and it's like oh yeah we had a water lake and then three eruptions and water lake's gone and you know before that it was lava lake and you think like wow this must be over decades like no it was just a couple of years it was five years you know like it was, yeah. it was pretty quick yeah i mean i think that that time lapse is three and a half years that one we showed three and a half years yeah really amazing how that whole just vanishes right huge All right. huge well, we'll do it for us this week um we will be back next week unless something happens then we'll go live and you know cover that you know always chance of that happening so other unless uh if that doesn't happen, Thursday is 5 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. We go live Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Thanks, Dane. And I really don't have anything else to add except another thank you for everyone, everyone for joining us, sticking out, sticking it out to the end here. We'll give you guys a little extra time today. I'm going to cut it off and not talk for another five minutes, Dane, so we can get our, get our time in here. So until next week, from HawaiiTracker.com, he's Dane DuPont. I'm Philip Ong. Hello, everybody. <laughs>